and thank you for joining me here today at Why the Book Wins, where I compare books with their movie adaptations. My name is Laura, and today we are talking about L.A. Confidential, a book by James Elroy published in 1990, and then the movie adaptation is also called L.A. Confidential and was released in 1997 and is directed by Curtis Hansen. And so this was part of a book first movie poll I had on my YouTube community page. And the theme for this poll was the Academy Awards, since the 2023 Academy Awards are just around the corner, hence the theme for this poll. But LA Confidential was part of that mix because it was nominated for Best Picture, Best Director, Cinematography, Art Direction, and Sound. And then it won for Best Adapted Screenplay, and then Kim Basinger won for Best Supporting Actress. And this was part of the 1998 Academy Awards and Titanic <laughs> was part of that. And so Titanic did win a number of those, which fun fact, I have never seen Titanic all the way through. I've seen bits and pieces and I saw like a fair chunk of it once on TV, but yeah, I've never watched that movie all the way through before. And I'm a fan of DiCaprio and Kate Winslet, but I just don't have any motivation to actually watch that whole movie. So onto the book review, this is the first James Elroy book I have ever read. Black Dahlia had actually been an option in a past book verse movie poll from like sometime last year, but it did not win obviously because I haven't read it. So yeah, this is part of the LA Quartet and this is the third book in the LA Quartet, Black Dahlia being, I think that's the first one. Anyway, I haven't read the first two books in this series nor the last one. So I don't know how this one relates to those. Like I know Dudley Smith is a character in the previous books, but Ed, Jack and Bud are all new and exclusive, I think, to LA Confidential. Although maybe Ed is in the next book. I don't really know. But anyway, yeah, this was quite something though, quite the experience. And I will start with what I didn't like about this book. There are so many characters, <laughs> like it is ridiculous how many characters there are. There is no way you could possibly keep track of every character and what they're doing and how they connect to the plot. Like it's impossible unless you are actually taking notes while reading this book. So I would recommend that if you are going into this book blind, prepare to take notes. And anytime a name shows up, write down the name, write down what they do and their connection to the main characters because otherwise you'll be so confused. Or if you don't want to take notes, check out the video I posted on Monday because this book was so confusing that I have a whole separate like video that is 25 minutes long just detailing the plot of this book and how all the characters connect because yeah, it was so confusing. And after I finished this book, I was like, wow, I don't know how I would tell anyone about the plot of this book because even though I just read it, I myself am so confused about the plot and do not understand it. So I went through it again and took lots of notes and I made that video, which I already posted. So, and so I will be talking about some things that I already talked about in that video, but that video goes more in depth into the book plot. So if you do wanna know more of the details as far as how the night owl connects to this and that, then you can watch that video. But we will be getting into the bigger points today as well. Anyway, so that is my first complaint with this book is just how complex the plot is and how many characters there are. It was a lot to take in. And next, the writing style was also, like it took time to adjust to that. And so it was hard to follow along sometimes. This does take place in the 1950s. And so you have a lot of slang as far as like the 50s slang. Plus there were parts where it was just written in a very abrupt kind of way. And yeah, there were times when like something important would happen and then they would reference it. And I'm like, wait, what? Like, I do not remember reading about that happening, but it's because the way it was written, some things just got lost in the mix. Although I will say when I went through the book a second time, I didn't have as hard a time following it. So I think because I just knew the characters and the plot to some extent, and maybe I was used to the writing at that point too, and I knew what I was looking for, maybe that helped. But the first time around, it was hard to follow for the complex reasons, but also just the writing style was just, it took some adjusting and it was tough to follow. And again, this is the third book in the series because it kind of feels like you're just dumped into it, but that might be my fault for not having read the first two books. And then finally, another thing that made this book not very enjoyable was the graphic nature of it, both like with the violence, but as well as like the sexual aspect because a huge side plot to this book is they are investigating these dirty magazines that are dirty pictures that someone made and they're trying to figure out who made this and who is trying to sell this. And so that's a huge part of the plot. But what was unnecessary is some of the details about those pictures that were gross 
and that we didn't need to, I didn't need to read about. So I didn't like that. And then also, obviously this is a mystery, a murder mystery crime thriller. And there is the Frankenstein case, which is not in the movie, but it is in the book. And the details of that case were very disturbing. And so that also was just kind of like, oh, like it was too much for me personally. And I did not like those parts because it was just like, it was just very graphic. And yeah, I didn't enjoy reading about that. But I will say I did like the three main characters. We follow Bud, Jack, and Ed. And even though a lot of the side characters, I would get muddled and confused, those three main characters for the most part, like I was able to keep them in line and I did enjoy seeing their character arcs. And this book also takes place over the span of like over 10 years. And I personally love books that take place over a long time. So I like that about it as well. And just going on the journey with these characters, I really enjoyed. And I do admire Elroy for writing such a complex plot. Like it is quite the feat. So even though it was a lot and it was confusing, it's also pretty admirable as well. And as far as if I would recommend this book, I, like I said, I would, if you read it, take notes. That is my biggest recommendation right there. But also just be aware of the content because that alone, because it was gross and upsetting, that would stop me from recommending it to just anybody because it wasn't just like, it wasn't mild, like it was graphic. So granted, you could always skip past those parts if you wanted, but I did go back and forth between listening to this on audiobook as well as reading it. And I don't know if I'd recommend that either, because I think it was harder to follow at times when I was listening. So I would recommend just reading it if it's your first time. The narration is by David Strathern, Stratham, Stratham, who plays Pierce Patchett in the movie. So he narrates this book and he does an amazing job narrating it. Like I said, I think because it's so complex though, it's better to read it than to listen to it. By the way, I love David Strathern. Strathern? <laughs> you would think I knew how to pronounce his name since I like him so much, but I have covered him in the past for Nightmare Alley, Dolores Claiborne, and Where the Crawdads Sing. So he's like a character actor and he always plays, you know, a side character, but he's always amazing and I love watching him and whatever he's in. But onto like my movie review section, before getting into the details of the plot, just my general movie thoughts. So Elroy and his agent laughed at the thought of this book being adapted and he is quoted as saying, we thought this movie was adaptation proof. It was big, it was bad, it was bereft of sympathetic characters. It was unconstrainable, uncontainable and unadaptable. <laughs> so you might be wondering like, how could such an unadaptable book be adapted. You know, one that has such a complex plot and has so many characters and the characters are very unlikable, like he says. And the way you adapt a book like that is you don't fully adapt it. <laughs> they trimmed down the plot a lot for this movie. They did leave out some details that made the characters more unlikable in the book. So in the movie, they're still not like the most likable characters, but they definitely made them more likable in the movie than they had been in the book. But this movie is incredibly popular, obviously, and it was very famous at the time with all the you know critical acclaim and everything. And I would say if you're a fan of the movie, I think you would benefit from reading the book and just getting the full breadth of this story because the book is, I don't know if epic would be the right word, but like I said, the movie just trimmed down quite a bit. And so if you like the movie, I think you would enjoy reading the book and getting the full story. And this is a great adaptation despite the changes it made because even though it cut down a lot and made changes to the plot, it still stayed true to the overall plot in general. Almost even more importantly, like it stayed more, tr it stayed true to the characters, our main three characters, it stayed true to who they are. And so I thought this was a fantastic ad adaptation and a great example of an adaptation that's amazing, even though it didn't like follow the book exactly. Which by the way, if this movie had followed the book exactly, like with some of the killings, it would have been like a horror movie because that's how graphic some of those scenes were. But thankfully it's tamed down, obviously, which that's the case a lot of times, books tend to be more graphic, whereas in the movies they have to tame it down to some extent. Extent. But anyway, I actually wish I would have watched this movie before reading the book because like I said, the book was very confusing. And I think if I had seen the movie first, it would have helped me have the characters in line and know some details of the plot that would help me kind of know where things were going in the book and make it easier to follow. But the book is also different enough that you could see the movie first and then read the book and you could still have a good book experience because there's enough changes that you don't know everything that's going to happen. So as far as the movie goes, I would recommend it. If you have not seen it yet, you should go check it out. It is available to rent on Apple. It is the breakout performances for Russell Crowe and Guy Pearce. So that was cool seeing them in an early role. We also have Kevin Spacey as Jack Vincennes. And then of course, Kim Basinger won an Oscar for her performance. So yeah, I would highly recommend this movie, check it out. And for the rest of this video or podcast, I will be getting into the details of the plot 
so there will be spoilers for both book and movie going forward. So trying to figure out where to begin with this because there's so much going on and obviously I won't be getting into everything that's going on with the book because there is so much going on and like I said you can check out that other video I did where I explained the book plot in, in more in depth. So some things I might not talk about here but I did talk about there. Anyway I will begin with uh, Ed and Bloody Christmas. So so Ed Exley in book and movie he is a cop and he is following in his father's footsteps who was also a cop and in the book he is a war hero. This is the 50s so he was a World War II hero because he had killed a lot of Japanese soldiers. However we find out that that's a lie. Like he got like a medal of honor or something for what he did but he came across these Japanese soldiers who were already dead and then he made it seem like he's the one who killed them. So his whole war hero story is based on a lie and it just shows his his cowardice but also his willingness to do whatever it takes to like rise in the ranks and to get that admiration whether it's earned or not and that is not in the movie also something that is also not in the movie is that his father is still alive in the book so Preston Exley is a former cop but now he is an investor and he has partnered up with Ray Dieterling. Ray Dieterling being like the Walt Disney of this world and Ray Dieterling is opening up Dream a Dream Land aka Disneyland and Ed Exley has partnered with him on it so they are opening it together. Whereas in the movie, Ed's father has died. So he died when he was on the forest. He was shot by someone and they don't know who shot him. It's a mystery. The guy got away with it. And so Ed is following in his father's footsteps, wanting to make a difference in the world. And so in the movie, like I said, he is more likable because we don't have that backstory about him faking his war hero status. But so Ed is on duty when Bloody Christmas happens, which is an event that took place in real life, actually, where a bunch of white cops beat up these Hispanic guys that were in custody. But so a lot of the cops, including Bud White and Jack Vincennes, get involved and they've been drinking and they beat up these men. But Ed Exley was like trying to stop it from happening. And so once the press finds out about it, the police are trying to find a way to contain the situation, but they know someone has to take the fall for it. And so Ed voluntarily is like, you know, I'll snitch on my fellow cops. I'm happy to do it. And so they end up having Dick Stensland who is Bud White's partner, take the fall. And he was close to retiring anyway. So they were like, we'll just have him retire early and he gets his pension and someone takes the fall for it. And you know, it's good for everybody essentially. And so this shows us how in book and movie, Ed is, is willing to do what it takes to get his promotion because he uses this as a way to be promoted by showing that he's willing to testify against his fellow cops. But we already knew he's willing to do what it takes based on the war story we got in the book. But in the movie, this shows us once again that, you know, in the movie, he's standing up for what's right right as well but he's also kind of manipulating the situation by using this as a way to get promoted and then Bud White was also suspended due to Bloody Christmas but then Dudley Smith this higher officer allows him to come back on early and he's like and you'll work for me so he basically becomes Dudley Smith's strong arm because they do a lot of uh interrogations and so Bud White is considered just like the muscle and so he'll beat these guys up until they get a confession out of them and he just basically does whatever Dudley Smith says now and Bud is also just thought of as not being very bright so he really is just the muscle in a lot of ways. And then we have Jack Vincennes, who is, again, was also involved in Bloody Christmas, and he also testified, but he testified because they threatened to take away his badge of honor position, which he, badge of honor is a TV show, and Jack Vincennes is like the uh, advisor for this TV show, and he loves working amongst the Hollywood stars. And he also has a partnership going on with Sid Hudgens, who works at the Hush Hush magazine, and so, and so they help each other out by either setting people up, and then Jack Vincennes captures them, and Sid writes an article about it, and so, so Jack is willing to set, testify against Bloody Christmas because he doesn't want to lose his place on Badge of Honor. But there is a backstory to Jack, which is not in the movie. And that is that one, he's he used to work narcotics and he was a kind of a drug addict as well as an alcoholic. And while he was on duty, he accidentally shot two people, a husband and a wife, and they'd had two kids. So he caused their children to be orphans, but he was able to hide that that was done. I forget how, I guess he blamed it on someone else. But since that day, he has not drank or done drugs. And so he's counting those days and it's, that was in 47 and we're currently in 51. But Sid Hudgens had known about him killing those two innocent people. And so Sid is kind of blackmailing him in a way. And so, in the book, they have this relationship where they're using each other, but Jack is also scared of what Sid knows about him and he doesn't want Sid telling the world about what he did to those two innocent people. And also in the book, he makes donations to the orphanage that the two kids went to. So every year he makes a donation as a way to try to make amends for killing those two people. And yeah, that was not in the movie at all. And I thought that was a great, 
part to his character in the book that I wish they would have included. So yeah, basically we have Bud White who has his own uh, code of honor because he also hates wife beaters because his father was abusive to his mother. And then he, his father ended up killing his mom and getting away with it. And so now as a cop, he is really harsh on men who are abusive to their wives and he gets them, you know, persecuted and put in jail or whatever. But once they're released and on parole, he will like go check up on them and threaten them and make sure they're still not hitting their wives essentially. So he has a weak spot for damsels in distress essentially. And so he's not thought of as very bright, but he is very, you know, <laughs> forceful and he is not scared of getting his hands dirty literally or figuratively but he does have like I said kind of like some kind of moral code to some extent and then we have Ed Exley who doesn't really have a moral code per se in the book especially he's just willing to do what it takes to get to get ahead whereas in the movie he does seem to care about doing what's right and about bringing justice while also manipulating the system in a way and not caring if his fellow cops hate him and then we have Jack Vincennes who just loves having the elite life of sorts with his Hollywood celebrities and manipulating people like with Sid Hudgens so that he can get his fame in the Hush Hush magazine while Sid Hudgens gets a good story and so they will set people up. But again, that has more nuance in the book due to his past, which Sid Hudgens knows about. So moving on to the Night Owl. So in the book, like I said, this book spans like 10 years, whereas in the movie, everything takes place within like a few months, not long at all. So in the movie, shortly after Bloody Christmas, in the book, it's a bit longer. But anyway, there is six people are found dead at the Night Owl Cafe. And in the movie, Bud's former partner, Dick Stensland, he is one of the people who was killed at the Night Owl. Whereas in the book, it was this like former police officer, police officer named Mal Lunsford, who was like a disgraced cop, who was now a security guard. And he was one of the ones at the Night Owl. So they just switched him out with Dick Stensland instead as a way to like trim down on the characters. But in the book, there was also a woman there who was a prostitute, Sue Lefferts, as well as a pimp named Duke. And I'm just going to skip the details, but basically they think it's this guy named Duke, but turns out it was a guy impersonating Duke. And the impersonator and Sue Lefferts, who is the prostitute, I don't know if I mentioned her name, she and this impersonator killed Duke in order so that this new guy could impersonate Duke and get in on Duke's business deals. But all of that is left out of the movie. There is no like Duke and Duke impersonator, but in the movie, Bud White sees is that Sue Lefferts is one of the women who was killed in the Night Owl and he had previously seen her with Pierce Patchett and Lynn Bracken and so he recognizes her from them and so he goes to see them and asking them about her since she has now been found dead. Whereas in the book he comes across Pierce Patchett and Lynn Bracken through you know the Duke trail and that eventually leads him to Pierce Patchett. Anyway, Pierce Patchett has like this uh, escort service of sorts of both men and women and they look like movie stars. And so Lynn Bracken is one of the women he has and she looks like Veronica Lake. And so Bud White interview interviews both Pierce and Lynn in the book and movie, but he doesn't think they were involved in the Night Owl because they don't seem to know anything about that. They just were connected to Sue Lefferts in one way or another, depending on if we're talking about the book or movie, but that was it. But meanwhile, in both book and movie, I hope this episode so it isn't going to be too confusing with maybe I should have separated out talking about the book and then the movie, but regardless. Anyway, in both, three black men are arrested for the killings of the night owl, but then when they are brought in, Ed interrogates them, and it turns out that they don't deny or confess to being in the night owl, but what they do confess to is that they had kidnapped and raped a woman named Inez Soto, and they say they think she's still alive, and they left her with this guy, and so when Bud finds out that a woman has been involved, he gets in... He runs over to where she is at and he and Ed save this woman and Bud kills the guy that had been with Inez. And so they bring Inez back and she's in the hospital and they're waiting for her to tell them like, how long were they with you? Like, did they have time to leave you and then go do the night owl? They're trying to figure all that out. And in the book, it is like a while later, like, I don't know if it's months later, but eventually these three men escape and Ed ends up going after them and he, he and some other cops kill these three men. In the movie, they escape and Ed kills them, but it was like within the same day or something. And when they escape and are killed, the DA Ellis Lowe in the movie, or, or sorry, in the book, he claims that the three men had confessed to doing the crime. And so, you know, Night, Night Owl case is closed. Those three men were unfortunately killed and didn't get a chance to be tried. But Ellis Lowe claims that they already confessed to him, so it's all good, essentially. 
And so they basically closed the night owl case at that point too in the movie. So to talk about Inez Soto, the woman who had been kidnapped by those three guys. So in the movie, Ed goes to get her from the hospital. While she was in the hospital, she told the cops that the men had left at midnight, giving them plenty of time to do the night owl killing because that happened at like 3 a.m. And so Ed feels like it's them for sure because they also had other evidence pointing to them. But then when he picks Inez up from the hospital shortly after, she confesses like, actually, they were there all night long. And Ed is like, wait, what? Why did you lie? And it's because she wanted revenge for what they had done to her. And she's like, if I didn't lie and say they were involved in the night owl, then they wouldn't have been punished because like nobody would have cared what they had done to me. So I lied in order to make sure I got my revenge on them. Whereas in the book, Inez like won't say anything about that night and she won't give any specific details as far as the time. And it's not till years later, it's like five years or more later where, long story short, but Ed finds out, Ed has a, rela a romantic relationship with Inez, but he finds out that she has been sleeping with Bud through the years. And so he confronts her about sleeping with Bud. And then she also uses that as an opportunity to confess like, and also with the night owl case, those guys were there all night long. So it wasn't them. You never caught the real killer. So in the book, he finds out years later and then they reopen the night owl case after all these years. Whereas in the movie, like I said, they like kind of officially closed the night owl case, but like the evidence was still being left out and it wasn't like officially closed. But also with Inez in the book, so, so after the night owl stuff, Ed is trying to like win Inez over. Also his mom was very sickly and had passed away. And so I think Ed is drawn, drawn to Inez because she was a victim and because she was like, you know, sickly recovering. And so something about that wanted him to win her over. And she didn't like him because she thought he was a coward, but she liked Bud because Bud shot that guy who had been keeping her hostage. Anyway, so Ed is trying to win her over. And since his father is connected to Ray Dieterling in Dream a Dream Land, he's like, I can bring you to the Dream a Dream grand opening. And she loves Dream a Dream. So she's like, yes. And she meets Ray Dieterling and he takes a liking to her and he offers her a job at Dream a Dream. And so Inez starts working for this company throughout the rest of the book and she becomes very close with Ray and Preston Exley. But to talk about Jack and Florida Lee. So while the night owl is happening, prior to that, Jack was on Vice and they were trying to track down who was making these dirty pictures they had come across. And in this process, Jack finds Florida Lee, which is this company, like I said, Pierce Patchett owns it and they have different men and women that can be hired out. Pierce Patchett also has women get plastic surgery to look like the movie stars, like I said. And so he hires this plastic surgeon, Terry Lux. But he calls Sid at one point asking about Florida Lee and Pierce Patchett and like, do you know anything about this? And Sid is acts very unusual and he has a line where he says like, we all have secrets, Jack, even you. And that's his way of threatening like, I know what you did, don't dig any deeper or I'm going to expose you. And so Jack is just very paranoid being like, man, like Sid is threatening me. Clearly he's involved with Pierce and Florida Lee. And so he's in this personal conundrum. And eventually in the book, he goes to see Sid and when he finds him, Sid has been brutally killed. And so while he's there, he's trying to find the documents that Sid has on him. However, someone had been there, I guess, and it was like emptied out and he didn't couldn't find the documents. But later on, he ends up getting the documents from Lynn Bracken because she'd had them along with other files. I forget how Lynn got them. But anyway, in the end, he like burns whatever information Sid had had on him. But Jack, when he finds Sid's body again, he like doesn't want much investigation done into Sid because he's worried they will the police will find out about his past. And so he doesn't call in Sid's death under his own name. He calls in pretending to be someone else. And when they call him in to see Sid's body, he acts like he had no idea. Whereas in the movie, so Jack, again, he's on Vice and they want him to find who, who, who made these pictures. And he had found a Florida Lee card earlier, which he did in the book as well. Anyway, so he knows it's related to Florida Lee, but after the night owl, he gets back on Badge of Honor. And so with Badge of Honor, Sid is almost wanting to set the DA up with this guy who works for Florida Lee and he wants to expose the DA with this guy. And so Sid pays him 50 bucks, which is in, in our day is like way more money. But in this moment, Jack starts to not like the life he's living and how he is setting these people up to be caught and just using it for his own gain. And so as he is waiting to show up and make this font, make this arrest, he leaves the money Sid gave him. He doesn't take it. And he goes later than he was supposed to, to help pick up the guy who works for Florida Lee. But when he shows up, the guy from Florida Lee has been killed. But going back to Pierce Patchett and Lynn Bracken, in the book and movie, Bud questions Patchett and he also ends up questioning Lynn Bracken. And 
he asks her out on a date ultimately. In the movie, he kind of takes a while to officially ask her out. Whereas in the book, he asks her out after that first interrogation and they start seeing each other. So in both, even though it takes him a while in the movie, they start dating. However, in the book, Lynn Bracken is 29 and the following month she turns 30. And in the book, Pierce Patchett makes his woman retire at age 30. So she works as a call girl for like another month and then she quits and opens up a dress shop in Los Angeles partnering with Pierce Patchett at the dress shop. But there was a great scene in the movie when he, when Bud White finally goes up to her and like sh shows he's interested in her essentially. She shows him her actual bedroom because in her house she has like this really elegant fancy bedroom that she uses for her clients. But she shows Bud, Bud her actual bedroom, right? Like revealing her true self. And I just thought that was a really beautiful scene and really touching. And there's a part in both book and movie where Bud White is like, you know, those other guys, they get Veronica Lake, but I get Lynn Margaret Bratton. And so showing how, you know, who cares about Veronica Lake? He gets the real Lynn Bracken. And yeah, so I just thought that was really touching. And overall, I just really liked their relationship. And kind of jumping around, but Lynn ends up sleeping with Ed and in the book, it made a bit more sense, I guess, but in the movie, it kind of is like, wait, what? Like, why is he kissing her suddenly? But anyway, in both, when Bud finds out, he goes to Lynn and he starts like slapping her or hitting her. And remember, he's very against woman, woman being abused by men because his father was abusive. And so in this moment, he's hitting her, but then he kind of realized what he's doing and he stops. Even though I don't like seeing something like that. I thought it was a good scene in the book and movie because he was so obsessed about not becoming like his father. But when you're so obsessed about not <laughs> becoming like someone, like you kind of do sometimes become like them because you're so obsessed about it, right? Even though you're obsessed with not being like them, it still is so much on your mind. And so the becoming what you hate kind of a thing. And so, yeah, I, I thought that was a good scene in book and movie, though it was also very sad and upsetting. But getting to the details of when they reopen the Night Owl case, like I said, this is years down the road when Inez tells him that those three men actually had been with her all night long, whereas like, like I said in the movie like the case is closed but they're leaving all the evidence out so it's not like officially closed and so Ed and Bud and Jack just keep returning to it and then eventually Ed teams up with Jack in the movie specifically it's like the two of them team up at one point but in the book and eventually like it's all three in both book and movie eventually all three of these men team up together and remember because Ed testified against Dick Stensland who had been Bud's former partner in both book and movie, Bud just has a lot of animosity towards Ed because of that. And so because they eventually have to work together, like it's a struggle for Bud in particular to, you know, work along with Ed, but each three of them have different pieces of the puzzle. And so when they come together, finally all the evidence is brought together. But remember I talked about the Frankenstein case. And so that had been a case Preston Exley had been part of where he had been the cop investigating that. And so there were photos of the people who had been killed, but Ed had seen them. Like the photos weren't given to the public. So very few people have seen these photos, but Ed was one of them because when he decided to become a cop, his father showed him these photos as a way to be like, you know, this is what you're getting into basically. And so when he sees the the photos of Sid's body, he realizes that the way he was killed was exactly like the way these kids were killed in the Frankenstein case. So he's like, wait a minute, like my dad must not have caught the real killer or there's more than one killer and he only caught one of them. And also in book and movie, they realize that Dudley is part of this whole scheme. Dudley is the cop who is like using Bud as a strong arm. And so Bud realizes that some of the things Dudley is wanting him to, you know, beat people up for, you know, noticing some odd things being like, wait, why is Dudley asking about this? And so he's starting to piece things together. So in the book with the ending, so Bud has, had also been investigating these killings of these various women in like the vicinity. Some of them were like in other areas, not LA, but it was close enough in the vicinity that he felt like there was a connection. And eventually he finds the two men who did it and he and Jack go to get them. And in this process, when they're getting these guys, Jack ends up being killed and Bud is severely injured. Meanwhile, Ed, like I said, he makes this connection with the Frankenstein case and they also interrogate Billy Dieterling who had been the son of Ray Dieterling and basically through this interrogation or so Billy and Timmy Timmy also works for Dream Dream he plays Moochie Mouse and Billy and Timmy are dating like they're together and so he's interrogating both of them and then eventually Billy is found dead and so this is when Ed gets more of the backstory from Timmy about Billy which they had just found out right before Billy had died he had learned the truth and so they tell Ed part of that truth and so then Ed goes to Ray Dieterling and hears the whole truth about the Frankenstein killer and so a reveal is 
So Ray Dieterling was married and had a son named Paul. While he was with Paul's mom, he had an affair and had the illegitimate child who he named Douglas. And Douglas's mom had like mental instabilities, which were genetically transferred to Douglas as well. And so Douglas is being influenced by like these weird cartoons, these graphic cartoons that Ray draws that Pierce Patchett comes up with because the two of them had been friends. And I get into this, like I said, in the video I posted the other day, I get into this whole plot line. But anyway, his son Douglas and the, his friend Lauren Atherton, the two of them were the Frankenstein killer. When Ray finds out that his son was part of it, like he doesn't want his son going to jail. And so he gets Lauren Atherton to be sentenced and accused. And so then the Frankenstein case is closed and Ray Dieterling has plastic surgery done on his son so that people won't recognize him. And he gives him the new name, David Mertens. He hires a nurse for him, Jerry Marsalis. And then Jerry and David Mertens, who is Doug, get a job on Badge of Honor along where Billy Dieterling, his other son, he also works for Badge of Honor. But then sometime later, a woman comes forward to Preston Exley being like, hey, I saw Paul Dieterling with Lauren Atherton with one of the children they killed. And so Preston Exley confronts Ray Dieterling and he's like, hey, like your son was involved. And Preston Exley does not like his son, Paul. And so he knows the woman had seen Doug with Lauren Atherton, not Paul, because Doug before his plastic surgery looked a lot like Paul. But since Ray doesn't like Paul, he lies and he says, yes, that was him. He was involved. And so Preston Exley is like, I can't let him go free. So if you just take care of this yourself, then you don't need to go through the public humiliation of having your son, you know, be involved with this case. And so Ray Dieterling kills his son, but says it was an avalanche that killed him. And so that, you know, appeases Preston Exley. But so Ed confronts his father about this and he's like, you need to pay the price for what you did, but I'll give you a few days to get your affairs in order. And he like tells Ray Dieterling the same thing. But then a few days later, Ray Dieterling, Preston Exley, and Inez Soto, cause she had been close with them, are all found dead at Dream of Dreamland. And it appears they have committed suicide. There is also this whole side story with Art Spain, who is Preston Exley's partner. Like they had been cop partners and now they're investing partners. Cause he was also involved the murder of these other guys who were connected to the dirty pictures, which I didn't even get into that with the book, but Jerry Marsalis, who was the nurse for uh, David Mertens slash Doug Dieterling. He had done the dirty pictures, but like, yeah, it's just like so much to get into. So uh, I'm just not gonna get into that here because this video is long enough. So you can just watch the previous video if you wanna know more about all of that drama. Anyway, so the book ends with the death of Ray Dieterling, Preston Exley, Inez Soto, and then Bud White is severely injured. Also, like I said, but he and Lynn Bracken end up getting together and moving to Arizona where she is from and living happily ever after, essentially. Pierce Pasha ends up being killed and Dudley White is the one who, Dudley Smith is the one who has Pierce Patchett killed. And they find out that Dudley Smith is the one who ordered the killings at the Night Owl because that guy Duke, he had wanted him dead because Dudley wants in on this new drug scene that had Mickey, Mickey Cohen had been part of, but then Mickey Cohen is this crime boss who was in prison. So Dudley is trying to take over this crime scene, crime business. And so he wanted Duke killed. And that is why that all happened. Um, but he's not able to officially get Dudley because as they're, you know, going across this trail of information, no one will confess to Dudley's involvement. And so they aren't able to actually pin anything on him, but they know he's involved. So at the end of the book, Ed Exley is still in the police force and he is like, you know, rising in the ranks. And he promises Bud White, who obviously is no longer a cop because of his injuries. So he promises him like, I'm gonna get Dudley. And that's basically how the book ends. And like I said, Jack ends up dying. And so I guess maybe in the fourth book, we see them officially nail Dudley, hopefully, but I haven't read that one. So I don't know for sure. Whereas in the movie, so they're piecing things together and then Jack talks to Dudley and he's like telling him what he's found out. And Dudley is like, have you told anyone else this? And Jack is like, no, I haven't had the chance. I came to you first. And so then Dudley shoots him. And that is when we realize that Dudley is the bad cop who is involved in all of this drama with the dirty pictures, with the drugs and everything. And Jack's final words are Rolo Tomasi. And earlier in the movie, Ed and Jack had been talking and Ed is like, you know, I joined the police because I wanted to make a difference in the world because my father was killed by him man and he named the man Rollo Tomasi because he doesn't know the guy's actual name but he's like I named him Rollo Tomasi and the reason I came a cop became a cop was so that justice would be served and people like this Rollo Tomasi wouldn't get away with things anymore but he admits that like somewhere on, along the way he lost track of his moral code, so to speak. And so he wants to find that moral center again and get back to doing what's right. And he asks Jack why he became a cop and Jack, Jack is like, you know, I don't even know anymore. And so they both have this moment kind of trying to figure out who they are and who they want to be. And so Jack's final words are Rolo Tomasi, this word, this name that Ed had given to his 
father's killer. And so after Dudley announces the death of Jack, you know, obviously not admitting that he was involved, he later goes up to Ed and he's like, hey, did Jack ever mention someone named Rollo Tomasi? And Ed like realizes like, wait a minute, like, how would you know about that? Um, like, so it clues him in that Dudley is shady in one way or another. And I love that moment. That was so good. But yeah, Dudley tries to get Bud White to kill Ed because Ed slept with Lynn Bracken and they show Bud White the evidence, like Sid Hudgens was involved. And Sid Hudgens had been partners with Dudley, but after Sid Hudgens tell, tells Bud that Ed had been sleeping with Lynn, Dudley then kills Sid Hudgens which was different from the book, obviously so many differences, but anyway, so he is hoping Bud will kill Ed, but then Ed stops them and he's like, hey, Dudley is behind all of this. He is wanting you to kill me. So we need to go against what he wants and we need to partner together. We need to work together to bring him down. And so they end up partnering and working together. And then there is a setup where they are both sent to the Victory Motel, which in the book, Ed goes to the Victory Motel, but now I can't remember why. Anyway, in the movie, they both show up there and Dudley had them sent there as a way to ambush them and kill them. However, there is a shootout and a lot of people are shot, but Ed and Dudley are left standing. And Dudley thinks that he's got Ed, you know, as a dirty cop now. And so as Dudley is walking away, Ed ends up shooting him, which earlier in the movie, Dudley had been asking him like, if he's capable of doing things that a dirty cop needs to do. And Ed is like, no, I wouldn't do any of those things. But then in the end of the movie, he does. He shoots Dudley in the back, showing that he is capable of making tough choices and making uh, not 100% legal choices, basically. So yeah, at the end of the movie, Ed is brought in and they're like, uh, can you explain yourself? And so he tells them the whole thing about how Dudley was involved and he ordered the Night Owl killings because Dick Stensland, who was the cop who was killed, had this heroin that he wanted from Mickey Cohen, who was the crime boss. And so he had the Night Owl killings happen so he could get back at Dick Stensland. And then Florida Lee, like how do the dirty pictures even go into the movie? This is just <laughs> so much to take in and so much to try to sort through. But anyway, basically Dudley was behind it all and that is why he killed him. But the police are like, you know, we can't give that story to the public. And so they wanna make Dudley out to be a hero who had died and Ed, uses this opportunity to be like, well, you're gonna make me out to be your hero too. And he's gonna use the system to get a promotion, you know, achieve his desires to get things done. And so in the movie and book, we see him using like the ways the police force lies. He kind of uses it and manipulates it to serve him as well. But yeah, at the end of the movie, we see him walking away with Lynn Bracken and we don't see Bud. Like he got shot at the shootout at the Victory Motel. And so I was like, oh my gosh, in the movie, Bud dies and Ed gets with Lynn. Like that's gonna be the end right now. And I was pretty upset because <laughs> I wanted Lynn to be with Bud. However, it is revealed that Bud is alive, but he is injured and Lynn and he are going to Arizona like they had in the book. And there's a line where Lynn says how, uh, because also in the book, because Ed's father died, he inherited millions. And so in the book, she's like, you know, some guy Guys get the world and millions of dollars. Other guys get a former prostitute and a trip to Arizona. <laughs> in the movie, she says something similar, but she leaves out the millions because obviously the story with his dad is different in the movie. But yeah, and then a big difference obviously being that he gets Dudley in the end of the movie, whereas in the book, Dudley still has not been accused of anything. Uh, but yeah, so that's it for the plot. I know that took up so much of this video and I know it was confusing, so I apologize, but this book and movie both have a lot going on and there's enough differences that it's just confusing to try to talk about both at the same time. But anyway, that's the basic premise of both of them. And so just my general thoughts for one, the movie, it does, it gives us exposition through the narration of Sid Hudgens reading his Hush Hush magazine. And I thought that was a great way to fill us in on what was going on without using like an actual narrator. And the book does this too, where it will have chapters where it's just articles and newspaper clippings informing us on what has been happening. So I like those in both book and movie. I thought that was well done. And I thought the performances in the movie were fantastic. James Cromwell played Dudley and he had just been in Babe, I think it was, where he played like a very likable person. So it, there was like extra shock <laughs> for the audiences at this time because they had just he seen him in this other movie and then suddenly he's here as the bad guy. And so people were very shocked at that reveal. Uh, but yeah, I love the acting by everybody. And we get great character arcs in both book and movie. You know, we have Ed who was cowardly in both book and movie, but especially the 
book and just like not had no loyalty to his fellow cops, which again, they were beating up those Hispanic prisoners and they were in the wrong. But by the end of the book, he learns loyalty and to trust his fellow cops and he pairs up with Bud and Jack and he learns to get focused on what he believes in again. Whereas in the book, like he had been intimidated by his father, but by the end of the book, he confronts his dad and he's like, hey, I'm not gonna let you get away with this. Even though people like Arc de Spain are like, please don't do this to your father. Like you can't do this to him. But Ed is like, no, like I'm gonna stand up to him and I'm gonna do this. And then we have Jack who also had a good character arc where in the book, he ends up like inadvertently confessing about killing those two people to Ed and his wife. Cause in the book he is married. And he, like I said, this had just been weighing on him. He also starts drinking again, partway through the book, which I forgot to mention. So he relapses and becomes an alcoholic again. But anyway, by the end of the book, his wife is like, hey, like I know about everything you confessed when you were delirious, but I still love you. And you know, he's at a good place where he's at peace with himself. And then he ends up dying. And same with the movie where like he has that realization where he doesn't like what he's become and he wants to change his ways. And so he is changing for the better when he ends up dying. And then we have Bud who is thought, like I said, to be dumb and he's just the muscle and no one expects much from him. But then in both book and movie, he shows them like that he had been collecting all of this evidence and he had been investigating and he isn't as dumb as people think. And in the book, Dick Stensland ends up dying a different way because Dick Stensland wasn't involved in the night owl in the book. But he leaves $6,000 to Bud and Bud uses that to go to school to further his education. So that was a cool part of his story as well. But yeah, even though the movie leaves out the backstory with Jack killing those two people and he doesn't have his wife, both book and movie, we just really do see the self-loathing that he feels and just the inner struggle that he goes through in both book and movie. And speaking of Ed and Jack, I did like the part, this is specific to the movie, where they go and are questioning Johnny Stampanato, who is a real person in real life. And in real life, he had been dating Lana Turner. And so they see him with Lana Turner and they think that she's one of Pierce Patchett's girls who is made to look like Lana Turner. And so Ed says something like, you know, a hooker made to look like Lana Turner is still just a hooker. But then uh, Jack reveals like, that's the real Lana Turner. Uh, and so it's just this funny moment where Ed is embarrassed and yeah. Anyway, I got a kick out of that and seeing the two of them partner together and grow, grow closer together. Also, like there's the part where in the beginning, Sid and Jack set this couple up to be arrested so that Jack can get in the papers and Sid gets a good, good story. And they're like, hey, like, should we get the movie theater in the background for like a really good photograph with like, you know, Hollywood. But there's also another part where they're at the Night Owl Cafe and it's Dudley and um, Ed and the cops show up or the press shows up and they're like, can we get a picture? And Ed and Dudley like pose for this photo, which it's just funny. Like they're in the middle of a murder case and then photo photographers show up and they like do a cool pose. So it was just very fitting since this is Hollywood, right? But also I wanted to do a shout out to Bullet Train, the book, because in Bullet Train, the characters Lemon and Tangerine are talking about like, if one of us is killed before you officially die, say a key word to your killer. That way when the killer says something about this key word, it clues in the one who's still alive to that being the killer. <laughs> and that's what happens in this with Rolo Tomasi. So because Jack says Rolo Tomasi to his killer and then the killer says it to Ed, Ed is clued in to be like, wait a minute, something's up with Dudley. They did what Lemon and Tangerine said you should do when you're killed. So I know this has been a long video, but I did want to talk about women in this book because this book is obviously centered around men, despite a woman being the prominent person on the covers of both book and movie. But in the book, we have two, both Lynn and Inez, who play key roles. We have Karen, Jack's wife, but she isn't like a key character in the book. But Inez was a great character and she was one of my favorites and I just really felt for her and I found her to be really interesting and well-rounded. And I also thought it was cool that even though this was based in the 1950s, 50s, he has a prominent woman of color be one of the main characters. And he does show the racism, meaning Elroy shows the racism of the time because in a letter we see um, like Art de Spain writing or someone is talking about how Ed and Inez have this relationship, which is fine because they know Ed won't marry Inez because that would be career suicide since she is Hispanic, which I don't know if I mentioned that, but she's Hispanic. So they're saying like, oh, he could never marry her though because that would be horrible for his career and just showing the racism. And there were a lot of racial slurs in this book, which I I get these are white cops in the 1950s so it makes sense that they're using racial slurs but it still was a lot so just be aware of that if you read this book but anyway even though I liked Inez and I liked Lynn I did think Lynn would be more of like a femme fatale and have some ulterior motive or something more going on but she didn't she was just there wasn't anything more to her like she wasn't involved in the case in some deeper level necessarily but what I didn't love though is that both main characters both woman characters like sex is a key part of who they are because Inez Inez is introduced in the story when she is raped by the men who were thought to be involved in the Night Owl. And then she ends up sleeping with both Ed 
and Bud. And then Lynn <laughs> sleeps with both Bud and Ed as well. And obviously sex is part of her character since she's a prostitute. And so it would have just been nice to have a character, a female character where sex wasn't a key part of who they were, right? Because it is just adding to the sexualization of women, I guess. But even so, I did like both of those characters and I did find them both very compelling. I was sad that the movie cut Inez's role down so much. She is in hardly any of the movie and Lynn is the focus, is the only female character in the movie. So I wish they would have kept Inez, but again, they were trying to trim down characters in general because there's just way too many characters in the book to fit into this movie. But onto book versus movie. So first of all, so much of the dialogue in this movie is taken straight from the book. So I love that because it shows the strength of the book's writing and the strength of the dialogue and that it fit and it just feels effortless in the movie where there's books where the dialogue is like, no one talks like this. And so if the movie tries to take that dialogue, it just doesn't fit and it does not sound natural. Whereas that is not the case here. I thought the dialogue was very natural. And so the book is well written in that aspect. And it also shows that the script writers, you know, they didn't need to fix what wasn't broken. Like they saw what was good and they just kept it the same. And even though I have a lot of complaints with this book, as I talked about in my book review portion, it is one that was very intriguing. And even though it was hard to follow, I never got bored with it. And it is well written, you know, Although I have my complaints with the writing style too. So as far as it being well, it's written in a unique way, I guess there is that to say about it. Um, but then again, the movie is a great adaptation and it shows how you can adapt something that is considered unadaptable. As after I finished the book, I was so excited to watch the movie because I just assumed I would like the movie better. And as I was watching the movie, I was like, yeah, I think the movie wins here. But then <laughs> when all is said and done, as I think about it, I'm tempted to say the book wins actually, which is, I'm surprised to say that because the movie it's fantastic, great performances. They stay true to the book. Uh, it's just really well done. And I like the twists in the movie, but the book, there's just so much depth in the book and there's just so much going on in the book, which is a pro and a con, but it's really close. I don't like doing ties. So I don't want to say they both win. So I will say the book wins. Uh, we also have Inez, like I said, and I loved her character in the book. I found her really interesting and I really felt for her and I liked her journey. Although I didn't love that she commits suicide in the end. I wish she would have kept living. So I didn't didn't love that part. But then you could also debate whether or not they committed suicide or maybe they were killed and it was made to look like a suicide. So then that kind of adds to the mystery if you think of it that way. But uh, but yeah, I'm getting kind of out of breath now. I've been talking for a long time, but <laughs> I'm going to say the book wins despite my complaints about it, which I did have some big complaints with it. But so it's re with a reservation that I say the book wins. So thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I know this was a confusing one and I myself am like getting a headache just trying to keep both books and movie in order. So I already know this video probably came out confusing. So if you've seen the movie or read the book, you probably were able to follow along. But if you had had not read or watched either, this video just probably made you really confused. So I apologize. But anyway, don't forget to like and subscribe. Like I just said, I also created a Patreon. So if you want access to bonus exclusive content, and if you want to support my channel, you can click the link down below and become a patron for as little as $3 a month. It would mean so much to me. Uh, Randall Griffith is a patron. Patreon. He signed up recently and he also commented saying he was really excited about my LA Confidential video. So thank you so much for becoming a Patreon and I hope you enjoy my LA Confiden Confidential coverage. Anyway, so don't forget to leave my podcast a rating and review as well if you so choose. But uh, yeah, thank you and I will see you next time. Bye.